technology. We don't have any technology that people, they're using DC-10s now as fire retardant delivery systems, and they used a DC-10 on the um, Thompson Ridge fire this summer. This is amazing. These are, these are jets. These are big jets. It used to be we all had these um, World War II era prop planes that were doing that. But these are huge airplanes. But even so, that's, it helps. You can, you can uh, manage the fire on the margins with things like fire retardant and helicopters and things like that. But we don't have any technology. And in our culture, we really worship technology, and for good reason. You know, this is pretty neat watch. I can <laughs> but you know, we really we put a lot of uh, credibility on technology. But I think when you're dealing with the natural world, and all of us who have bodies know this with medicine, there's a limit to our understanding. There's a limit of what we can do, and technology is on fires is very, very limited. Um, we can't continue to build. Um, homes right on the commercial, on, on the wildland urban interface. We've got a vast number of buildings being added to the, the wildland urban interface, meaning like where I live, the edge of the forest and the town, all over the west, all throughout the west, there's millions of houses being built or shopping centers, all kinds of things being built in, in the urban interface. And these people all expect that the federal government is going to put out the fires and protect those, those houses. Yet, at the same time, those people will not allow the federal government to have any prescribed fire close to their homes. It's too scary. So, therefore, we have to do mechanical thinning, which is vastly expensive. That has to be done close to the cities. But at the same time, in Washington, they're cutting budgets for the federal land agencies continuously. Um, the uh, Obama administration has proposed a 20% um, cut in the uh, fuels management budget for next year. 20% cut is a huge thing. You know, the, the budgets for these, these public land agencies, whether it's the National Park Service or the Forest Service, the BLM, have already been cut year after year after year. These people are running on bare bones. They, their staffs are down to the minimum. Um, the only way they get money to deal with fire is on an emergency basis every year from, the, from Congress. So, on one hand, the, the Congress is cutting the budget for all this stuff, and on the other hand, those of us who live out here are hoping and expecting that the federal government will come to our rescue. You, we can't have it both ways. It's not going to work. These agencies need to be funded. They need to be fully funded um, to do uh, wildfire management, not wildfire suppression. Fuels management over the whole landscape. And it's, you know, the Forest Service manages 200 million acres in the West. And the U.S. Uh, National Park Service has about 90 million acres. And all of these acres need some level of fuel treatment. And the only way we're going to really get ahead with this is by doing large-scale prescribed fires. We're going to have to start doing prescribed fires that are 10 to 20, 10 to 30,000 acres um, at a time instead of these little 1,000-acre, 2,000-acre fires that we've been doing over the past. But talk about fear and lack of um, tolerance of smoke, and you can see that we've got ourselves going and coming on that one also. We can't demand that federal agencies keep the air in Santa Fe and elsewhere unnaturally free of smoke while freaking out about wildfire when it happens. You're going to get smoke one way or the other. You're going to get it from prescri prescribed fires, controlled burns, or you're going to get it from wildfires. And the wildfires happen at the worst times usually in terms of, of what we call uh, dispersion or you're going to get it. You're going to get a lot more smoke from wildfires than you're going to get from prescribed fires. So the best thing to do is tolerate the smoke from the prescribed fires. It's a much, much better way to do it. The other problem we're having with um, wildfires smoke in the West is in a lot of places like California, and actually in New Mexico too, smoke is regulated. These agencies, if they want to set a prescribed fire, they have to go to the state agencies which implement the Federal Clean Air Act and say, hey, we're planning to put a whole bunch of smoke in the air for the next five days, and uh, how's that with you? Well, <laughs> out in California, like in Yosemite and Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks and the big national forests on the, on the west side of the Sierra Nevadas, those agencies are, they can't, they can't do it most of the time because the air quality in California is so bad. It is already so saturated with diesel smoke from, from agricultural use from all that pollution that comes from the Silicon Valley and the San Francisco Bay 
all flows into the Central Valley all the time. And by the way, everybody in, Cal in San Francisco always talks about how clean their air is. They're clean because it gets washed into the Central Valley every day. And it accumulates down there, and so you have this huge pool of smoke. So here comes the National Park Service saying, well, we want to we want to burn 10,000 acres just to get the ecology of our park back to where it should be. And the state agency say, I'm sorry, you can't do that. We don't have any margin for you to put that smoke into the pool. Yeah, that so basically the answer is no. So the Park Service has a choice of saying, well, shall we just ignore them? We're, we just need to do this. It's, anyway, it's a problem. And it's a problem around here, although New Mexico's air is so much cleaner that we don't really have that particular problem too much. More around here is just public intolerance of smoke. Okay. Let's see. I, I'd say finally that there, yeah, we can't ignore 50 years of science that we've, we've got that prove that livestock grazing, commercial logging on the Intermountain West and the Sierra Nevadas for that matter, worsen fire conditions over the long run and do little to mitigate fire, be fire behavior over the short run. And you're seeing a lot of this now where a lot of people are saying, oh, well, we need to put more cows out on the landscape. That'll help deal with the fire issue. And it's, it's, kind of, it's silly, you know. People who really understand ecology is just, it's just a, it's a shallow argument. And the same with doing commercial logging. Our, our illustrious uh, congressman from southern New Mexico is making a big push nationally now to really restart the subsidized logging programs on the national forests in the southwest. And something that fortunately sort of died off in the 1990s. And I don't think the economy in New Mexico really noticed that change. I think that there were some, understandably, some people in rural areas like Bayacitos and up in that area who, who have been forced to do other things, but that's been happening with the natural resource economy forever. <coughs> but in any case, there's the people who are twisting the science around saying, well, if we could just start cutting down the big trees again and put more cows out there, and this whole fire situation would calm down, and the fire situation is as bad as it is because we're not allowing enough grazing and enough logging. In fact, the science proves exactly the opposite is true. The, uh, those things are the things that have gotten us to the situation where we are now, combined with fire suppression. So it's just the long run versus the short run, and people who are uh, pandering versus those who really want to solve the problem. There is some progress to report on wilderness fires like Harosa. The Forest Service actually managed that fire beautifully, I thought. They, let it go, it was a uh, lightning fire. Lightning fires almost, or whenever you have a lightning fire, it doesn't matter where it is, the first choice is always to let it burn and see what it will do. Human started fires are still treated as suppression fires. Okay, well, the Harosa fire was interesting. It started up in a bunch of blow down, a bunch of dead and down trees that were tangled up up there, and that's why we saw that huge plume. But the Forest Service, for the most part, let that fire just do its thing. and it. It started to eat up some of those 100 years of accumulated fuels that we have in the Pecos Wilderness. And they, they managed it on the south edge a bit because they didn't want it to burn down my family's home up there in the Pecos Wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question and kind of move also into the answer while you're on Marissa, though? Yeah, just let me, let yeah. me just uh, finish this. I've only okay, got we'll two more okay. points and then I will, okay. I will be done. And then I can... Uh, become even more informal than I already am. <laughs> On fires like the stable fire that's happening above uh, Hema Springs right now, the Forest Service has recognized the positive presence of that fire and is slowing its management and allowing it to burn as much land as it can because it's fairly wet. And they're, they're, I, I see them doing some very progressive things with that, including back burning, which is, can be a positive thing. Sometimes it can be uh, very intense and very damaging to the forest. But that one's fairly positive. And their approach to that showed some real enlightenment. Um, and I mentioned this, this effort by these land man these certain people, especially in Washington, to try and force the Forest Service and BLM back to their 1930s full suppression mode. What's beautiful to see is there's been a tremendous backlash against that. And those people have been thrown on the defensive and have had to crawl back into their caves. <laughs> so I think that's, uh, so we are seeing a lot of progress. Uh, but generally speaking, I would say that we are our own worst enemy on this whole issue. We've got ourselves going and coming on the whole thing, and I'm not sure what is going to happen given the media presence and the, the way, the way the, a largely urban population that's moving into the West, into places like Santa Fe, 
precedes the natural world and the disconnect of the, of the urban technological culture with the natural world and the fact that the natural world is messy, it's ugly at times, it's smoky at times, it's messy, it's not always pretty. It's not just wallpaper, it's actually uh, dynamic reality out there. And uh, it's, it's going to do things that we don't like. It's going to produce bears and wolves and, and fires. And all, those are all things that, that push us to our limits. So. Well, we've had this big monsoon season, so when would be the best time to do prescribed fires, particularly here in Santa Fe? And does anybody else to have questions following this? Yeah. yeah. Great. I, I would say that to deal with... Um, with prescribed fire, you have to you have to set it when it's going to behave the way you want it to. With the Cerro Grande fire, they were pushing the limits. They wanted to they wanted to kill a lot of medium-sized trees because they had such an invasion of trees in this area that had been heavily logged and and um, grazed before the Park Service got it. So they were trying to correct that by running a fairly hot fire through there. And so you have times where you want to burn things when they're fairly dry. Unfortunately, they were pushing it too much with the system they had in place, which I detail in the book. But other times you want to you want to start fires when it's really quite wet, and then it'll just creep around and and do a fairly smoky but good thing for it makes a lot of smoke when it's wet. So when can you do it? You can do it in the spring when there's if you've had enough snow and things are fairly wet. That's that's the time that we know from tree ring data that that's when most natural fires occur here in the southwest is in the spring. Or you can do it in the fall, which is always more difficult because things are wet and the days are getting shorter, shorter and the shadows are getting more intense in the forests. So it's harder to find a dry enough time in the fall generally if you've got a normal monsoon season. So that's, that's harder, but it's really the shoulder seasons. And it may be with climate change that the time to do it is going to be in the winter time. We're going to start to see when the temperatures are low, yeah. what we call the burn period is fairly short during the day, the time when fire is likely to burn fairly intensely, that's short in the winter time. So that would be maybe with climate change, that would be more and more of the time when, the, but that assumes that the federal land agencies have got personnel on hand to work in the winters and that the budgets that they are now, that's a good question. So you just touched on uh, part of what I wanted to ask you about the sale of burning fire. People get freaked out after having watched that go awry. And they were pushing it, they had reason to do it, but why did it go awry? How did it get so out of control? That's the, the, the big thick book over there. Um, to make a long story short, what happened uh, was, just to, to, to make a long story short, the Park Service, for a variety of reasons that I detail in the book, understaffed the fire. It was, it was an okay idea what they wanted to do, but they didn't have enough people standing by. They weren't getting, generally speaking, what happens is the, the Park Service has got a small um, fire management team. The Forest Service provides, the Forest Service and BLM provide vastly most of the firefighters and firefighting equipment for the West, all throughout the West. So a little, a place like Yosemite has got a fairly big team of people that do fire. But generally speaking, the National Park Service everywhere is dependent on the Forest Service for additional personnel if they want to do a large prescribed fire or if they have a suppression fire on the National Park. Bandelier in the past, when I when I was working with them back in the 1980s, we used to invite all kinds of Forest Service people to help us with uh, with prescribed fires. And the upper Frioli's fire that we had in 2007, I was working on that and we had a bunch of people from the state and the Forest Service that were helping with that one. By helping, I mean just holding, just keeping an eye on the perimeters. They didn't do that with Cerro Grande. They, they really understaffed the prescribed fire. The Bandelier people thought that they could do it on their own. And, but the part two of that was they, they had talked to the Forest Service and the Forest Service had assured them if they needed people to come and help them, they would come at a moment's notice. And in fact, they didn't come at a moment's notice when they did need them. And that was a long, messy situation that actually ultimately involved Congress and changed the way fire management policy is done in this country. That fire actually had more change, more effect on fire policy in this country than any other fire since about 1910. And it was really because of the way the, the two agencies were interacting with each other. The Forest Service and the Park Service have always hated each other. 
But they, at times, they have to cooperate and do things together because almost all national parks are surrounded by national forests. And um, if you don't know the difference between the two agencies, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Our histories are very interesting. And again, it's something I go into it. Yes, a question on uh, climate change and rising temperatures. Do you see any, or do you know of any evidence of uh, migration of uh, birds, animals, trees, plants to higher altitudes? Yeah, I see a lot of aspens yeah, down in town here. Yeah, is that right? yeah, definitely. And what what we're seeing is um, the the forest types are moving upslope, and this isn't going to happen. You know, we're, we all live such short amount of time. It's not something we necessarily will see anything but evidence of. Now, but over the long term, we're seeing the pinyon juniper forests are moving up, and the ponderosa pine forests are dying off on the lower limits. Like where I live, up on, up on, on the side of Atalaya, all those trees that were affected by mistletoe are now dying because of the drought. So down comes like the ponderosa pine, and up comes the juniper and, and, uh, and pinyon. And those trees really need to be controlled by fire. Those trees should not be as thick as they are around Santa Fe at all. If you look at these old photos of of Santa Fe from the early early 1900s or from the turn of the century, you can see that the hills around Santa Fe have spatterings of pinyon and juniper and lots of grass on them. And now there's just dense pinyon juniper. That's all overgrazing fire suppression. But we are seeing we are so what's happening is the, the forest types are moving upslope, and a lot of animals like pikas and marmots are going to really be in trouble because they need that high elevation. And if the high elevations become much warmer and the forest types are moving up to higher elevation, there's going to be a lot of losers in that picture. And probably things like marmots and pork bark fur and things like that are going to be, be the ones. Hi, um, my name is Joe. Um, I'd like to call the attention that the Public Relation, uh, Public Regulations Commission and that Valerie Espinosa has an ongoing series of task force meetings now. Uh, I'm not sure when the next date is, but if they meet at the Para Building. And it's trying to bring together most of the, of the stakeholders, including the Forest Service and, and, and the utility companies who are very concerned because the last couple of fires were due to utility, uh, which is interesting what you're saying, Tom, because even 10 feet extra clearance is not going to solve the problem with 100 years of neglect. And that, that's a message that I'll, that I'll certainly bring. My question is this. One of the things I think is rather than reinventing these best practices, who would you point to that has kind of step up on most of these things and, and shares a lot of the same problems and challenges that New Mexico do. Is, you know, is any of the other surrounding states? You mentioned Oregon. The problem is that most of this, the real fire policy is happening on the federal level. You can have uh, states like California have got large amounts of state land, but it's, it's still relatively small compared to private land. There's a lot of private land in places like California, but that's it's I don't know, it's really, the game is really on the federal level. The Nature Conservancy on their properties is doing a lot of very progressive um, fire management. The National Park Service continues to be the leader on this in terms of really um, researching and implementing progressive fire policy. And it doesn't, as Cerro Grande proves, it doesn't always go right, but for the most part, there's, they have very few accidents compared to the successes that they have. But it's, it's hard to say. I'd say, generally speaking, it's a matter of, of shifting the whole picture as, as best we can, and that pulls us into this whole national debate about climate, climate change and about budgets. You know, I don't think Paul, Paul Ryan cares one little bit about the national forest. You know, he's, you know that's, that's, it's just, it becomes the large, pulls us back into our larger conflict that we're having as a society about how we're going to perceive the world and, and who's going to do what and who's, how we're going to pay for things. Your point about the power lines is very interesting because you look at those rural utility companies that are stringing power lines through the woods. And there's a lot of fires that happen with that. A lot of them get suppressed right away and we don't hear about. But that's another case of externalizing the cost to somebody else. They can say, well, we're going to just string these cheap lines through the woods to serve whatever. If they were to bury those lines, it would cost a whole lot more money, but it would prevent this whole problem. So the question is, who's going to pay? Are we going to pay with houses burned down with, with all these... Um, uh, fires that are happening at, at a time when they're very intense, or are we going to, uh, as rate payers, say, okay, we're going to bury these lines? Who's going to pay for it? It always gets external, external lines. Yeah, um, you, mentioned, you had mentioned um, people's perception of smoke and fire. It's being driven by the media. 
type of, oh, it's awful, it's terrible. So do you have any ideas on how to change those perceptions and also be more honest about what it really means to live out here? Mm. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I, you know, I think all you can do is, is uh, have people who inject uh, more realistic opinions into the discussion whenever you can. Uh, I don't. It's a it's a real problem getting to getting to people and getting them to understand complex issues, or not making them complex and you know, just helping them understand this is just natural. I always tell people fire is a weather event. Fire is weather. It's driven by the weather. It happens because of weather and people. But it's it's really determined by the weather. And smoke is just part of part of fire. It's just a very natural thing. It's no different than wind and rain. And people just need to understand that it's not. We're not going to make it go away. We can't. It's impossible. So it's just a matter of people saying, oh, okay, I see this is not going to go away. So what am I going to do when there's smoke right now? I can leave. I can uh, wear a mask. I can stay indoors. You know, there's things you can do because these fires don't go on forever. They're short-term events. So, uh, good question. I'll throw it back to you. Well, I was just thinking, actually, when I don't know if it was about St. Helens blew up, and then I think they did some media report later on what yeah, from a natural perspective, from the natural world perspective, it always adjusts to fires. These things like Los Conscious that were horrifically, unnaturally intense because of climate change and drought, those fires are really can be quite destructive to the natural world. But the natural world will adapt. It will, it will fix itself. It may not fix itself into what it was before, but it's going to, it will recover in some way. By the way, in the Las Conchas fire, we had um, uh, alligator bark junipers out in the uh, back under bandolier that were 3,000 years old that were killed by that fire. So that tells you how unnatural that fire was in terms of its intensity. And that's a human creation. It's both you know, land management and climate change that are causing that intensity. I'm a little embarrassed to ask this, but because it sounds really stupid. I, I understand a lot of the really bad effects of logging, but I don't really understand how it contributes to forest fires. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. I don't need to feel stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Okay. The question was, how does how does logging uh, contribute to uh, wildfire hazards? And generally, what happens when you have an overstory of big trees? They, um, they tend to shade the understory, and little trees have trouble really doing very well in that sort of shade. That's true in most forest conditions, except in the Pacific Northwest, where trees are adapted to growing in the shade up there. So once you open the, once you cut down the big trees and open the forest floor up to a whole lot of sun, what happens is all the little trees start to grow like crazy. And so unless you go in there and either burn frequently to kill a lot of the little trees, <coughs> or thin mechanically to kill a lot of the little trees. You get an overpopulation of trees. So what's happened in the West is, generally speaking, we've had all kinds of, of logging that we taxpayers have paid for in, on the public lands, and this sort of release has happened. And yet the agencies haven't done anything to go in there for the most part. I, mean, I can't generalize. Of course they have in places. But for the most part, we haven't gone in to say, oh, look, we released all this stuff. Uh, we better thin out the, the understory that's coming in. And also, logging tends to leave a lot of slash and debris around, which is flammable for decades. So that's the uh, other problem. The best thing to do with logging operations is to, to wait a year or two and do a, a burn through the area afterwards. And then you have to come back like every 10 years or let nature do it. Well, you know, percentage-wise, how many fires fall between the versus Humans versus, fire, how many fires are started by humans versus wildfires? And second, the third question, uh, is the park service or the car service reliable in any way for these alcohol burns? I don't really know the statistics. I think probably a majority of fires are human caused, I would guess. I don't have the statistics in front of me, but that's my guess. Um, are they liable? If it's a prescribed fire that gets out of control, if it's an intentionally set fire, I 
think the courts and Congress have perceived that the agency may be liable for lost property in those situations. Um, with Sarah Grande fire, uh, Congress and the administration moved in immediately to compensate people in Los Alamos. Yeah, it was a big part of the reason that that was the most expensive fire to date. I don't know if it still is, but for a long time that was the most expensive fire in, in U.S. history. But um, generally speaking, I don't think the liability extends to wildfire. Like if you have a lightning fire or if you have somebody who a campfire and houses get burned down by that. I don't think that the courts have felt that the agencies were responsible for people's homes and that kind of thing in that situation. But there are all several lawsuits against the Hemis utility for these yes. fires. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the lawsuits against the utility companies for the power lines. Yeah, the, the uh, Tres Lagunas fire was started by a power line also. Could, couldn't the uh, public uh, use use the wood that the prescribed firms take? Where, except I, I understand there's some places that are unaccessible, but where it's accessible, I think the public would welcome the chance to get in there and get some of that wood. I, I don't mean to go into lumbering business, but but you know, well, that's a really good question. For building and, and and the other just the other thing was uh, uh, those 19 was it 19 uh, folks that died over in Yarnell. And, uh, if that's just for property protection, to me, I think you just back off and let it happen. I, I don't think people should be dying for property right, or something like that. Nobody thinks they should be dying for property. But I would say, by the way, that that's, that's a good point. The first question is, fire does more than... Um, fire is an ecological process. So when you, when you burn an area intentionally, you're not just reducing fuels, although that's a... The agencies tend to talk about that a lot because that's a big benefit from it, reducing the intensity of future fires. So fuel removal by fire is a, a big part of it. But a lot of it is the whole process of nutrient cycling, of killing lots of small trees that nobody wants even for firewood, of uh, replenishing various plants that need fire as a stimulus, like grasses. Grass loves fire. Uh, so it's a, it's a process, and the removal of uh, excessive trees is only one element of it. I would say that there's so much mechanical thinning going on that there's plenty of opportunities for people to get away from that, and, and even the Park Service and Bandelier changed their policies on that. They were never letting people collect firewood before, but after a lot of the thinnings that they've done over the years, they're now inviting the public to get the wood as long as they're not driving vehicles out there to do it. So, yeah, people, people can do that, but it's important to think of